Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We appreciate you coming this way. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to everyone. And you in the radio listed audience, if you call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour, then we'll endeavor to be a blessing to them. And that way you can help them and we'd appreciate it very much. So now at this time, we'll turn the song service over to Paul and he'll direct the musical phase of this good hour. So. What he has lined up for us, I'm sure, will be a blessing to our hearts. So, Paul, at this time. Get your hymnal, turn to page 271. appreciate that song today. I want you to turn to several places in the Bible. I want you to turn first of all to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And then we'll read another verse or two in Hebrews chapter 2. Are you listening out in the radio listen audience? Remember that we're recording the service today. We'll be recording the message tonight on the book of Revelation. And then we're heard on this station seven days a week. We're heard through the week each day at 12 noon. And this is a faith ministry and a home mission work. And we'll look to you that love the Lord and can see the need of this ministry to pray for us and stand by us. And I want you to write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards. P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. If you'll write to me next week, I appreciate it very much. 
We have many, many dear shut-ins, many people in convalescent homes, even those in jails and prisons, and people that are aged and shut-in in their homes that can't go to church like you can here in the auditorium today, that depend entirely upon what they hear through the radio and so forth to get the gospel messages on the Lord's day and through the week. And you that stand by this type work, you're standing by a wonderful home mission work indeed. And this radio ministry is part of the ministry of the Northside Baptist Church. And we want you to know that. Now I want you to remember very well the scriptures I'm using today for my text because what I'm going to say of course is based on the word of God and these uh, text verses are very important that you remember them. And I'm reading first of all in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading verse 26. Verse 26 is page 1227 in the original Schofield Bible. It says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now if you notice here the Bible calls death an enemy. If death is an enemy, then it's not a friend. It's not something that uh, the sinner would enjoy. And you must remember that. Now look again at verses 55 and 57 of 1 Corinthians. Verses 55 and 57 of 1 Corinthians 15. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. Now with that in mind, I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and take a close look at verse 31. It's found on page 1301 in the original Schofield reference Bible. Hebrews 10 and verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now let that verse of scripture sink in because it's going to play a great part in what I'm about to say in a few minutes. It says here it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of the living God. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 2 right back to your left chapter 2. And look at verses 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, if you'll notice in the scripture I read in your hearing that death for the unsaved man is not something that's very welcome. And the reason I say that is because of a heresy that's spreading across the land today. And that is what, what is called the near death heresy. Now, you have read and you have heard, you've seen it on the news. You've heard people talk about somebody being or uh, what they thought was dead and they came out of their bodies and then went back into that body and is alive today. You've heard people talk about that, you've read about that. They've made a couple of movies pertaining to the near-death heresy and it's written about in many periodicals and of course there's books written about it and most of these people, probably at least 95% of them or more, were unsaved people that knew not God that claimed they left their bodies and they experienced one of the most joyful experiences they've ever experienced in their lives. They claimed they floated around in midair. Some claimed they saw the doctors working on their bodies in the hospitals and then they went back into that body and alive today. And every one of them is talking about what a wonderful, wonderful experience it is to be near death or to die. And they're unsaved people making that statement. Most of them are unregenerated. Now according to the scripture I read in your hearing, 
The Bible says the terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The Bible speaks of death being an enemy. The Bible speaks of the sting of death. Now that's very, very unscriptural for those people to make that statement. That is not of God. And that is a trick of the devil and what he's trying to do. He's trying to make it appear that it is wonderful for people to die whether they know God or not. And you'd be surprised after people heard others make that statement and had that experience. Even sinners want to commit suicide that they might experience that. Or they want to come near death that they might experience that joyful experience that sinners claim to have experienced and have gone back into their bodies and live in today. Now don't you believe one word of that. Those people did not die. When a sinner dies immediately he falls into hell in a place of torment and without a doubt he goes to hell screaming as he enters into the regions of the damned. It is a trick of the devil, propaganda of the devil to have these unsaved people to brag about the wonderful thing contrary to the Word of God. Only can the Christian say that death is like a shatter or could be a wonderful experience. No sinner can say that. Christians can say that. And these people that claim that, over 95% of them, they have been checked out and found to be unbelievers some that do not even believe the Bible to be the Word of God, that do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, that know not God. Some are atheists, some are infidels, and they don't believe in the hereafter, and they brag about that. Now that's a heresy, and it's spreading all over this land. Two movies being made about that, books being written about that, it's a cunning attack of the devil to deceive that sinner to get him to die without God. Now, lost man, you better listen to me. Lost woman, you better hear this preacher. When you die, if you die without God, it's not going to be a wonderful experience. You'll be screaming as you leave your body and enter into the flames of a tormenting hell, whether you believe that or not. So don't you be carried away with anything the devil has to offer in these last days to deceive people. He is trying to make death so beautiful until sinners would think it's so wonderful that when they die they'll be looking forward to it and that they don't need God and don't need to repent. It's a terrible heresy and you better believe it and don't you believe a word of it. No sinner has ever died and came back talking about it being wonderful. If a sinner dies, he don't come back. He doesn't come back to this life. He goes down in the hell while his body is being buried in the cemetery. Amen. The Bible said the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. And that was immediately after the soul left the body. The rich man didn't say he floated around in midair, and how wonderful it was to leave the body and look back and see what was happening. He didn't say that. The Bible said he screamed in hell, cried in hell, and begged for water and begged for mercy. So don't you believe these things, the devil, the propaganda, the lies the devil puts out today to deceive poor lost sinners to drag them into hell. That's exactly what he's doing. Now my message today is based along that line. And I want to show you why you should not wait until death or wait until the last minute in order to get saved. You need to get saved right now because you don't know when you're going to die. I know there's some people that experience what is called a deathbed experience. But only a very few of those people ever really mean business. They're just afraid and they make a profession, and if they could uh, get their health back again, renew their health, and continue to live on the earth, most of them would go back out into the world and live in sin. Like the man that couldn't get along with his neighbor. They hadn't spoken for years. 
They were very angry at each other, embittered toward each other, hated each other. And this man was on what he thought to be his deathbed. And he did not want to die feeling that way toward his neighbor. And he called his neighbor in. He said, neighbor, I think I'm dying. And I don't want to die with this hatred in my heart toward you. And the way we've been acting over the years, I don't want to die like that. I want you to forgive me and I want us to be friends. But this thing I want you to understand. If I don't die and I do get well, we continue on as we've been continuing on. Now that's the kind of deathbed repentance that you find in the land today. People think they're going to die. They make a profession. And then if they could get well, they go back out and live in sin like they always did, proving it was not genuine. But don't misunderstand me. There are some people that do get saved on their deathbed. It's scripture. But not many of them. Some do, but not many. The Bible says in John chapter 6 and verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I would in no wise cast out. At any time a man is saying, and he can repent and believe, he can be saved if he really means business. Now if he's just merely making a profession because he's afraid, he'll die without God. Now the thief on the cross was a case of deathbed repentance. There were two thieves there. One died and went to hell. The other died and went to paradise. Now the man that died and went to paradise received the Lord Jesus when he had the opportunity there on the cross and he was saved. That is a deathbed repented, so to speak. The other man did not believe and he went on and died without God. Now you do have some today that die and would rather come to death and get saved. Now Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of England many years ago, had a doctor to check out the people that made a profession on their deathbeds. And out of this check by the doctor, only three out of a thousand that repented on what they thought to be deathbed lived after they recovered. That is out of 3,000 people that made a profession on their deathbed that got well, that did not die, although they thought they were going to die, they made a profession, only three of them lived for God after they gained their health back. Another great Bible scholar, Arthur W. Pink, gone on to be with the Lord. He made a check on this. He said he found one out of a hundred that made a profession on his deathbed that revived, gained his health back, and continued to live. Only one out of a hundred really meant business and really got saved. Now had the all died, only one of them had gone to heaven. The other 99 had gone to hell. Out of the 3,000 that the doctors checked in England, all of them but three would have gone to hell. Those three would have gone to heaven. So what I'm trying to say to you is this. Don't you play around expecting God to save you on your deathbed. Chances are you'll go to hell. Very few people or ever save on their deathbed, so to speak. You need to do business with God while you can, while you're in your right mind. You might not have a chance in a matter of seconds before you die. And this rotten heresy today that's going about the land and will be promoted and talked about in days that lie ahead is of Satan and is devised to get poor old sinners to think that death is so wonderful, they'll be looking forward to it. But the Bible said it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And you better believe that as an unsaved person. The only person that can rejoice about the matter of death is the Christian. God has taken that sting out of death for that Christian. And for the Christian, death is like going to sleep and waking up in the morning. And so you need not fear death as a Christian. That's wonderful. God's made that provision. Now, why shouldn't people go ahead and get saved instead of waiting until the last minute? There's several reasons. I'll mention a few of them. Did you know to wait until your deathbed in order to get saved that that's very, very unfair to the Son of God? Now, think about that. 
The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. The Bible said the time to get right with God, remember God is in your youth. Don't wait until you burn out for the devil and blow your smoke in God's face. A lot of people say, well, it's my business. I'm young. I have plenty of time. I'm going to have a good time and live like I want to. And when I come down to die, then I get right with God and God will be glad to have me in heaven. And so I'm just going to live it up. That's what the devil wants you to do. You have no guarantee or promise you're going to grow old. You may die young. Go to the cemetery and check the grave markers and see how many young people you'll find out there. Our young people are slaughtering themselves on the highways today in automobiles by drinking whiskey and on dope and drugs and so forth, ripping up and down the country, killing each other and slaughtering each other on the highways. Young people in their teens, late teens and early twenties. Now you have no guarantee you live to be old. I've heard people say, well, I'm young. I have plenty of time. I can get saved later on after I've had a good time in sin. There's no more happier people in the world than Christian young people that know God. You're deceived if you think you can't have a good time as a Christian. You're greatly deceived. Christians have a greater time and enjoy life far more than sinners. Every blessing you have comes from God. God lets the rain shine on the just and the unjust. And God lets the sunshine rather than the rain come on the just and the unjust. And God holds your breath in his hands. In Daniel 5, 23, it said, In, those, in whose hands thy breath is, and whose all thy ways is thou not glorified. Now you go out here and live for the devil, and you don't realize that God holds your breath in his hands. If God mind to, he could thump it out and in hell you'd go. It's only the mercy of God and the goodness of God that you're alive. You go out and curse and live like the devil, ignore God and the Bible and God's church and, and God's people, ignore Jesus Christ and breathe God's good air and enjoy God's good sunshine. You don't realize that God could thump your breath out and you'd be in hell in a matter of seconds. You don't realize that. But that could happen, and that may happen to some of you. And so it's unfair to Christ. Secondly, whenever you wait until the end of life's journey in order to get saved or hoping to get saved, you're taking sides with Satan against God all the days of your life. I may be speaking to someone today, you're 40 years old. You're not saved. You have been on the side of the devil since you reached the age of accountability. And you have been against God in the devil's camp all of these years. You have been fighting against God. You've been against God all of these years. And you've eaten God's food. You've drank God's water. You've breathed God's air. You've enjoyed the beauty of this universe. And all the time you have been on the side of the devil fighting against God. Every sinner that know not God is on the side of the devil and he's fighting against God. You may not realize that. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, he that's not with me is against me, Jesus said. So if you're not with the Lord, if you're not saved, you're against God. Oh, you say, preachers, I'm neutral. No, you're not. If you're not saved, you're against God. You're in the devil's camp. There's only two camps, the camp of God and the camp of Satan. And you are not neutral and you cannot straddle the fence. You're either on one side or the other. And if you're in the devil's camp, you're lined up with the devil fighting against God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the Lord God, neither indeed can be. There's no way that sinner can glorify God or please God unless he takes Christ as his Savior. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus said, You of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you'll do. And then we come to the third thought, and this thought is very important, and you shouldn't wait, you shouldn't put off Christ any longer. That is, number three, you should not presume upon the tomorrow. You may say, Preacher, what do you mean? In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1, 
The Bible says, Boast not yourself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So don't say what you'll do tomorrow, you'll do next week, you'll do a month from now. You may be in hell or heaven uh, tomorrow. It all depends on whether you die saved or lost. There's been many of a lost sinner that's made plans for things to do tomorrow and next week that died without having to having fulfill those plans. You're presuming upon the tomorrow. You're bragging about what you're going to do later. And there may not be any later as far as you're concerned. In Luke chapter 12, we have there a man that said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build greater barns. I'll store my goods, get them all fixed up. And then I'm going to say, soul, soul, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. What did God say about that man? In Luke chapter 20, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 20, Jesus said, thy fool. This night shall thy soul be required of thee. So James said in the book of James, you ought to always say the Lord willing will do thus and thus on tomorrow. Don't brag about what you'll do tomorrow. You may not be here. I may not be here. And so by waiting, you're presuming upon what you're going to do tomorrow. A lot of people say, well, I'll get things fixed up. I'll get things in order. I'll straighten up this and I'll straighten up other things. And then I'm going to live for God. God didn't say for you to do that. Like the song said, come as you are. Without one plea, it was his blood that was shed for thee. You need to come to Jesus just like you are. And then do your straightening up and straightening out. After you get saved. Don't wait you straighten things out. You may never get them straightened out. You may die before you do so. Then we come to thought number four. And that is by waiting until the end of life's journey. By delay you're losing valuable time. Many years ago in one of the, my former pastorates. A man stood up and gave a word of testimony. His hair was white as snow. That man had only been saved just a matter of a few days. And he stood up and tears trickling down his cheeks. And you know what he was weeping about? He said, I'm weeping because I'm an old man. And my life has been wasted. And I'm soon coming to die. And I've wasted all of my life and done nothing for God. And that man shook with sobs. That's something to cry about. That's something to weep over. And that man died in a short time after that. And he was greatly disturbed because all of his life he had lived for the devil and fought against God. And now he was about ready to be ushered into God's presence and had done nothing for God. You need to remember God in the days of your youth and do all you can for God because time is running out. Then there's others that say, well, you know, uh, uh, I, I live my own life. I'll do what I please. It's none of preach others' business and nobody else's business. I live like I want to, do what I want to, do as I please. And that's nobody's business. It is somebody's business. The Bible says you're hindering or helping others as you sojourn through life. The Bible says no man liveth to himself. And no man dies to himself. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself and no man dies to himself. So you must remember that you don't live to yourself. You don't die to yourself. You're touching someone somewhere at all times. You are touching somebody. You're influencing somebody. You are helping or hindering someone. There's some of you men right now in your homes and you're supposed to be the head of your house and there sits your wife and young'uns and maybe it's been weeks and months and maybe you've never darkened the door of the house of God and you're sitting there as a hindrance. If you'd be the man like you ought to be, you'd rise up and say to your family, we go into the house of God, we're going to do right. But you won't do that. You're hindering your family and you may go to hell and your whole family may go to hell because of what you have done. You have hindered your family and led them on the wrong road. And you're going to answer to God for the day of judgment. If you die and go to hell and your wife and your children 
raise up in hell and point their finger in your face and said, if you'd have been the husband and the daddy you should have been, we'd have gotten saved, we'd have gone to the house of God, we'd have done right. You're going to face that the rest of your eternity. They're going to be pointing their finger in your face and accusing you for not doing it. Some of you men out there in the radio listening audience, you ought to wake up. You ought to wake up. You end up in hell with your family. You're to blame for it. That you're going to face the rest of eternity. You need to realize that. You don't live to yourself and you don't die to yourself. In Psalms chapter 1 and verse 1, Blessed the man that walked in the castle of the ungodly. Now study the way of sinners, now sit in the seat of the scornful. It's always good to be on the right side. Now we know then that the thief on the cross believed the first time he had a chance. He didn't play around about it. When he was explaining... Uh, to him the matter of salvation when it was explained to him he accepted the Lord and the Bible tells us that God is, will save sinners and Jesus died for the sinner and you know that you ought to do something about it and then that we come to another thought and that is when people come to the end of life's journey and then make a profession for most of the people it's a fear of death and not to live right we've already pointed that out now when you come to die and you make a profession because of fear and you don't really understand what it's all about and you don't really mean business, you still die without God. When men make a profession of faith, their minds must be clear about the matter. They must know what they're doing, understand what they're doing, and the Spirit of God must work with them. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And the matter of being saved is more than just giving a little mental asset to the plan of salvation. The matter of getting saved is committing yourself fully and personally to the Savior, accepting Him as your Savior and as your Lord. Don't many people do that on their deathbeds. Not only that, but are you listening to me? Very few people ever get saved after they grow old on this earth. You check on people that get saved after they pass 70, and you'd be surprised. Even after they pass 60, or after they pass 50, you'd be surprised at how few people ever get saved after they live all their lives for the devil and grow old as sinners. Their hearts are so hard, their necks are so hardened, and they just don't believe, they won't accept God, they're set in their way, and they'll die and go to hell. Most of the people that populate heaven are people that are saved as children or young people. Very few people ever get saved after they get up and pass middle age. You'd be surprised how few ever get saved after they pass middle age. Now you ought to think about that. There's some of you people right now, maybe in this auditorium, out there in the radio listening audience, you've done up in years. Your footsteps are slow. You've seen the frost for many winter. Your hair's white and you're lost. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give much for your chance of being saved. You'll go on like that and die and go to hell because your heart is so hard, you won't repent. You'll go right on, shake it off, say, well, I'm doing the best I can or something of that manner. Now, you could get saved, but you won't. That's a tragedy. Some of you old gray heads listen to me. You could get saved, but you won't. You'll die and go, you go right on die and go to hell in spite of this preacher warning you because you just won't get saved. You've been living for the devil all your life. You've cussed and lived in sin, and now you're old. Your footsteps are slow, and, and you're set in your way, and you're not going to change. You're going to walk on right into hell, and that's pitiful. That's terrible. Most people get saved while they're young. And you need to remember that. Now waiting is very dangerous. I will say that in closing my message. Waiting is very dangerous. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That verse implies there may be a time when he won't be so near. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. You better come to God while he can be found. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. The reason you have so many people today that are cut off suddenly is because they've hardened their hearts against God, and they're just cut off. 
In John chapter 7 and verse 34, the Bible said, You shall seek me and shall not find me. Now you can find God today, and I won't promise you may find God later. You can find him now. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is accepted time. These four things could happen to you suddenly. Number one, you could have a heart attack. Many a man that thought he was in good health had a heart attack suddenly and dropped off in the eternity. You could have a heart attack. You could think you're getting along fine and have a heart attack. Secondly, your mind could snap and you'd never be sane again to be able to get right with God. You'd die and go to hell when you die if you've had the chance and didn't take it. Number three, you could have a stroke and never come out of it and die. Number four, you could have an accident. You could be killed on the highway or some accident, maybe on your job. These four things can happen to any of us at any time. Therefore, it pays to be ready to meet God. Prepare to meet God, O Israel, said Amos the prophet. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment, and you're going to die. The question is, where will you go after you die? That's left up to you. I hope it'll be to heaven. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you use the message. That you speak to many hearts. That you help people realize how dangerous it is to wait. And keep putting off salvation. I pray that you will speak to many hearts. In the name of Jesus, our precious Savior. Amen. Amen. Now listen to me just a moment. The ladies are going to play on these instruments. As they do so, if you're in this building unsaved, or backslidden, or you want to join this church, or for any reason you feel like you ought to come to this altar and let us help you or pray with you, we'll be glad to do so while they play a stanza so. Would you come? How about it now while we wait? If you need God, now's the time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now's the accepted time. Just a moment or so. Be glad to help you.